Allah geleceği biliyorsa özgür iradeden bahsedebilir miyiz? So the question about the time. Um, yeah, so in philosophy of religion, in analytic philosophy of religion, uh, there is this kind of desire to try to be able to explain everything when it comes to God, uh, to try to explain every facet of theology. And so if you look up any sort of doctrine that theists typically will endorse, whether it be omnipotence, God's omnipotence, or God's omnibenevolence, or God's Uh, in Christian uh, philosophy of religion, it's, you know, um, how can we explain the Trinity or the Incarnation? And uh, so you see lots of different models, right? Lots of different models everywhere trying to explain um, these uh, facets of theology. And and there's just this, this desire to be able to kind of put God in a box and to be able to say, this is exactly what we mean when we say, God is all powerful or all good or all loving, or this is exactly what we mean when we say God's a trinity, right? Or uh, that, that God could take on human flesh. And, and uh, oftentimes I'm very dissatisfied with these models. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm thinking like, actually, I think the, the models, they have big problems. Um, uh, so it, and to talk about um, I'm a Christian. And so from a Christian perspective, Uh, oftentimes models of the Trinity either turns what's called tritheism <laughs> uh, or it turns into um, some sort of kind of Unitarian view of God. And um, there's this kind of this, this, this worry where what happens, what do we do when, the, when these models for God's omnipotence or uh, his foreknowledge or um, uh, kind of specific revelatory Um, theological matters like the incarnation of Trinity. What happens when, uh, what happens when these 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 models aren't good, right? Um, should what's what's the sort of the, the rational thing to do here? And so um, this the sort of approach that we're taking is saying no, like paradox is okay, right? Appealing to paradox, like. Um, It, it's I know it's 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 not all the range these days in analytic circles, but actually like maybe um, theism predicts paradox, and maybe theism, especially if you understand God um, more classically. And so I can I can sort of articulate the sort of view of God that we have when we were making this video, or sorry, when we were making this uh, the paper, writing the paper, um, but. Um, So that's helpful. I'll do that. But actually, I think that what we call classical theism actually predicts that there will be lots of kind of paradoxes because our language about God's only going to be analogical. And so there's going to be room for unarticulated equivocations. Right. So um, let, let's go ahead and turn that route now to, to sort of define what I mean by classical understanding of God. Right. So in analytic philosophy of religion, at least mainstream analytic philosophy of religion, there's kind of two sides here. There's one side that wants to see God primarily as a person in the same sense that you and I are persons. Um, God is complex. He's, you know, he has properties. Um, God is in time often, right, with this sort of conception of God. Um, God is, uh, in being in time, he's, he's mutable. Maybe he's not changeable in his essence like like he's going to remain good yesterday and, and you know from yesterday to today but the idea is that that god um uh can be affected he can he can go through change he's in time and so uh you know people who will advocate for these types of uh views think alvin plantiga think william lane craig think richard swinburne and then you have sort of a the more classically minded individuals um think you know saint thomas aquinas think uh more modern day proponents someone like ed Fazer or brian davis uh where uh god is seen as timeless as uh immutable strongly since there's there's no change in god whatsoever right unless you want to kind of include cambridge properties or something like that Um, and so, uh, you know, God is seen as simple. He's not made up of properties. I mean, the, 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 all the predicates we give to God um, are actually um, expressing the same truth 
<laughs> it looks like the different truths to say that God's all powerful or God's all good, but actually it's these are all just shorthand descriptions of saying one and the same thing, namely that God is. He's not, not made up of parts, else the parts would become more fundamental to God than God himself. And so on this kind of very classical conception of God, our language about God, it's not univocal. Um, that's to say we're, we're not using the words uh, in the same exact way. So, for example, if I said, hey, would you mind um, handing me um, uh, a bat? And you said, OK, here you go. And you gave me a baseball bat. And I was like, great, thanks. <laughs> This is this is what I was uh, hoping for, right? We're using language in the same exact way, right? We call this univocal use of language. Now, if I said, "Hey, could you get me a bat?" and you hand me like a little animal with fangs that sucks blood, right? And I'm like, "No, no, 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 not that, <laughs> not that bat," right? We're using the same word, but we have utterly two different meanings, right? Um, so it sounds the same. It looks like the same, but actually, it's not. Well, analogical language is supposed to exist in between this kind of univocal use of language and the equivocal use of language. Uh, it's it's in between these two uses of of language, and so our 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 language about God then is it's analogical. It's not univocal. It's not equivocal. And so this is going to be important because on this classical conception of God, when we say that God has power or God has knowledge. What, we're not going to mean it in a univocal sense, as if I was predicating knowledge and power to you, right? It's going to be somewhere in between univocal and equivocal. Uh, so in, in remember, um, for this kind of classical conception of God, God's power is just identical to his knowledge, which is just identical to his goodness, which is just identical to his existence itself, right? And so um, it, clearly we, we can't... Um, uh, kind of loosely ascribe these attributes to God uh, in the same way we would um, do so to human persons, to creatures. And so given that's the case, we should expect our language not to meet eye for eye when it comes to God. And so we, we, we have room then for, um, there's going to be unarticulated equivocations that occur if our language about God, at least as positive predications, are based off of um, analogy, analogical language. And so when we talk about um, models of God, when we talk about God models of his omnipotence, his omniscience, and so on and so forth, uh, I think actually this sort of strong classical theistic um, conception of God is going to predict, like we should expect there to be unarticulated equivocation. We should expect it there to be appearance of contradictions when it comes to um, uh, ascribing God uh, these particular attributes. We should expect paradoxes to arise. And so that, that's that's all what we mean by paradox. Paradox isn't a genuine contradiction. It's, it's an apparent contradiction, uh, but that actually is not a genuine contradiction, right? Um, and so uh, that's what we're going to try. This move that we're going to make uh, in the paper is going to um, appeal to that. When we say we're appealing to paradox, that's what we mean. So um, now kind of having set that background, right, our sort of background assumptions, um, what I can do now is I can talk about um, the specifically the um, divine foreknowledge, human freedom issue. And uh, uh, then I'll talk about cases of paradox and why I'm believing in paradoxes um, uh, can be rational. And then I've sort of come full circle and I'll I'll help kind of deliver our our, our response to this issue that, that Michael DeVito and I uh, make in the paper. Uh, so um, when it comes to divine foreknowledge, human freedom, let's say that uh, tomorrow at 12 o'clock, God knows infallibly that you will drink orange juice at 12 o'clock, right? 12 p.m., you're going to open the fridge, you're going to get some orange juice and drink it, right? God knows this infallibly. That means God can't be wrong 
about um, you drinking orange juice. And let's say God infallibly knows right now, right? Call this T1. That tomorrow at 12 o'clock, say T2, you will drink orange juice. Well, if he knows infallibly such that he can't be wrong about it, then how do, should we understand your freedom? Do you really have the power to not drink orange juice at 12 o'clock, right, at T2? Do you really have that power? Because if you did, then that would seem like to say that God didn't actually have an infallible belief. You've shown God's belief to be false or wrong. Um, and so if, if God infallibly knows at T2, uh, or sorry, at T1, that at T2 you will drink orange juice, then you can't help but drink orange juice at T2. There, there's nothing you can do about it. Like, it's going to happen. And so the idea here is that uh, what philosophers uh, who care about a particular conception of freedom, known as the, the principle of alternative possibilities, right? In order to be free, in order to be morally responsible, you have to have the ability to do otherwise. You have to have that power within you to do the action or refrain from doing the action, right? Or maybe doing a different action. And so you do really have this power to do otherwise when it comes to drinking uh, orange juice at T2. Well, if God infallibly knows that you're going to drink it, then the idea is that you don't actually have this power. Right? Uh, so what do we do here? Right? Some philosophers, what they'll do is they'll say, all right, well, we just need to change our conception of freedom. Let's go ahead and get rid of uh, this idea that in order to be free and responsible, we need to have the power or ability to do otherwise. Maybe it's just as long as um, you are ultimately responsible for your actions, as long as there's nothing that is um, uh, kind of coercing you, as long as you're ultimately um, the, the vehicle of your action, the cause of your action, not something else, then, then you're free. I mean, call this kind of the Augustinian response to the human foreknowledge, uh, divine foreknowledge, human freedom problem. Um, right, so what's a problem with this is, well, some people really like the idea of the principle of alternative possibilities. And they're like, no, I want more. <laughs> I want to be free in the sense that I, I have like really robust freedom, that I have the ability to do otherwise. Um, this kind of more minimalist freedom that I'm free just only insofar as I'm not being coerced or I, I'm, I'm the primary, you know, cause of my actions, um, you know, that, that's, that's not good enough. I want even more. Um, another sort of response is to just deny that God has foreknowledge of future contingents. Um, so it's, this is the open response, right? Open theism, where God doesn't actually infallibly know that, uh, you know, tomorrow I'll wake up, that tomorrow that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do some work or I'll hang out with my wife and kids. Uh, God doesn't know, infallibly know any of this, right? Well, a problem with this view is that, well, <laughs> um, uh, those who like to hold on to the classic theistic traditions, whether it be in Christianity or Islam or in Judaism, right? We want God to have foreknowledge, <laughs> at least most of us traditionally have wanted God to have foreknowledge, uh, fallible foreknowledge of future contingents. So that's not really attractive, right? So, you know, what do we do here, right? Can we really have our cake and eat it too? Can we have it where we have robust freedom and yet at the same time, um, God has infallible foreknowledge? Um, and the the sort of move that we, we make now that I've already discussed the kind of conception of God that I have in mind, uh, you might first say, wait a minute, this is this is perceiving God anthropomorphically, the sort of scenario. Maybe you think that God doesn't even have beliefs. Right? He doesn't have beliefs of future contingents. He doesn't have beliefs at all. Right? Beliefs are things in which rational creatures possess, not God. Um, God is metaphysically simple. Um, you know, uh, we, we, so he can't be like uh, possessing, God can't be possessing all these different beliefs uh, as if, um, you know, in the same way, like you and I have different beliefs, right? Or different acts of thinking, right? I mean, God can't have that. He's, he's simple. Um, and, and what it means for God to have knowledge has to be different than what it means for you and I to have knowledge. 
Because our knowledge isn't identical to our goodness or power, but with God it is. It's identical to his existence. And so whatever it means for God to have knowledge, um, uh, maybe whatever, that, maybe, so, so you know, rephrase this. Maybe when it comes to how creatures have knowledge, that is inconsistent with uh, freedom and future contingents. So you, maybe if I infallibly knew something about the future, um, the way I have knowledge, the way I have belief, maybe that is incompatible with certain creatures under certain circumstances actually having freedom. But maybe whatever it means for God to have knowledge, maybe that entailment doesn't follow. Maybe that doesn't flow from whatever it means for God to have foreknowledge. And so th this is kind of the, 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 the response, the idea is that um, uh, we don't know what's kind of entailed by God having foreknowledge because God's not going to have foreknowledge in the way you and I have foreknowledge. So just because something follows from us, if we had foreknowledge, infallible foreknowledge, doesn't mean that's going to follow from God, especially if you think God's knowledge isn't even propositional. Um, then, then it gets even more of this. This, this, this uh, again, um, this, this whole anthropomorphic understanding of God having beliefs and so forth doesn't even make sense at all. Um, and so it, it seems completely reasonable to just go ahead and endorse these these two um, propositions. We have um, uh, libertarian freedom in this kind of strong path sense, and God has infallible foreknowledge of future contingents. How does this resolve? Who knows, right? Um, but that's not really a surprise because on classical theism, I think we're supposed to expect paradoxes we're, we're supposed to expect things aren't normally entailed um uh when, whenever it means for god to to you know possess these attributes and and, and uh, features and so forth um it, but that's okay like uh, as like james anderson um his work on christian uh paradox uh sorry theology and christian theology and paradox uh, paradox and christian theology there we go i have it right next to me <laughs> um uh, you know he gives this great example so in New Testament studies, there's this a New Testament theology. There's this whole idea of the kingdom of God being here, but also not yet, right? And so um, you might think that uh, th there's a sense in which the New Testament says the kingdom of God is not here. So Jesus, uh, he prays that, for example, and um, uh, our Father, he prays uh, that. Uh, the kingdom come, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the kingdom is not in its fullness, obviously. Right? We're praying for the kingdom to come on earth. But yet at the same time, he casts out demons. And he's like, if I cast out demons by the spirit, the kingdom of God's here. Right? So there's this kind of tension, this weird tension that how, how the kingdom of God's here, but yet it's not. Right? This already, not yet. But let's say you didn't know any of this. And let's say you're just like you're coming to listen to a preeminent New Testament theologian talk about this and you maybe you stayed up the night before anderson says you know maybe you're, you're really tired right and all of a sudden you hear him say the kingdom of god is here uh according to the new testament and then you're like okay great and then you're just like maybe i don't know doze off you know you fall asleep and then um all of a sudden you wake up you're like oh wait, i need to pay attention to this lecture and you hear him say the kingdom of god is not here you might think, well, wait a minute. <laughs> How is this guy so brilliant? Why, why, why is everyone here to see him? He just contradicted himself. He said the kingdom of God's here, and yet the kingdom of God's not here. What? How, how, how is this reconcilable? So you, you might just think, well, the guy's just totally off. You know, He's not anyone to listen to. Or another response might be, say, you know what? I'm not sure how both of these propositions can be true. It appears as if they're in tension. It appears as if there's a contradiction. But actually, it's just beyond my cognitive capability to actually figure out why it's not a contradiction. It's beyond my kin. And so in the same way, that's, that's, that's you know, it's irrational, it seems like, in this circumstance to affirm a paradox. And so if you, if you have, have um, good warrant, and uh, we sort of use Plantinga's proper functionalist type 
uh, epistemology to discuss this. If you have good warrant for thinking that we have um, libertarian freedom, we have the ability to do otherwise. And if you have warrant, independent warrant for thinking also that God has exhaustive foreknowledge, say divine revelation or um, uh, the magisterium, the church, what, whatever. Um, it might seem like these two things are intention uh, or you can derive a contradiction out of these views, but um, uh, it's, it, maybe you think that it's it's rational in the same way that it's rational to think the kingdom of God's here or not here. Um, it's it's also rational to hold both these propositions, even though it seems from our perspective that they entail a contradiction. So anyway, that's that's the idea of the paper.